Hey guys, Mr. Myas is here. How are you doing out there? Um, you got me. See, I got my Star Wars background. It's May fourth. May the fourth be with you. Got my Star. Well, it says Stat Wars. It's not really a, a Star Wars T-shirt, but it says it's like Star Wars. It's a play on Star Wars. Stat Wars. Anyway, we're doing stats today. Welcome. We are looking at. I want so on this video. What I want to do is I want to go over something that kind of confuses some students here, here and there, quite often, and that is. How do we make a conclusion on uh, a hypothesis tests on inference? So how do we make an inference on the population based on a confidence interval? And a lot of times I'll ask this question in my, in my stats classes, you know, what does this confidence interval tell you about this? Um, it doesn't give you evidence of this situation occurring. So we're not doing a complete hypothesis test in this case. We're just looking at the confidence interval and seeing if we can tell something about whether we would fail to reject or reject a null hypothesis had we been doing a hypothesis test the whole time. So uh, let's take a look at that and uh, I'll kind of run through this idea very quickly. All right, so here I have an example and um, you know, I should have said, a, a, I should have said like a Starfleet, right? <laughs> no, that would be Star Trek, like a, um, like a rebel uh, fleet or something like that. Uh, but we'll just talk about cars here. And what we want to do is we want to um, have a goal of, of uh, having a fuel efficiency goal of at least 28 miles per gallon. So we're going to be we'll have at least 28 miles per gallon. We're, in order to meet this goal, the company uh, does a, a sample size of 50. They randomly select it. They find a mean of 27.02 miles per gallon and a standard deviation of 4.83. Is there evidence? So anytime we see evidence, if you see my other videos where we're talking about um, confidence, um, sorry, hypothesis test, anytime it says, is there evidence we're doing a hypothesis test, some sort of inference procedure. The question here is, is there evidence that they have failed to attend their economy goal? So let's first talk about the hypothesis test. So if we were going to write a null and alternative hypothesis, what would those be? Well, our null hypothesis, let's see if I'm writing here. Our null hypothesis is going to be mu is equal to 28 miles per gallon. That is a kind of our baseline, right? Mu here is going to be our mean miles per gallon for all cars in the company. And I know if my handwriting is bad, sorry about that, you know. Um, and our alternative hypothesis is gonna be mu is, now um, they need to have at least 28 miles per gallon. So if they have failed to attain their goal, that means that 28, if they, they do not meet their goal of 28 gallons, so that's gonna be less than 28. So I'm gonna say mu is less than 28 miles per gallon. So this would be evidence that they did not meet their requirement, okay? So they failed to meet it. So that's why we have that bolt failed. All right, so now if we were gonna do a hypothesis test, what we would do is we would next do our conditions for inference, which by the way, you have to write those conditions whether you're doing a hypothesis test or a confidence interval. Anytime you have inference procedures, you have to do the, the conditions. So really quickly, just the conditions. Um, random, a random sample, so we did, we chose a random sample of 50 uh, company trips. We have to have, um, independence we'll assume that each trip is independent of one another and we can also assume that 50 trips is less than 10 percent of all trips that we've taken in that company and then uh, finally we want to have our uh, central limit theorem here down so since uh since our n our sample size is greater than 30 we can apply this very easily to our um to our problem here so that would be one way that we can fulfill that condition is that our sample size is greater than 50. so um, since we have our conditions going satisfied and I had to run them down, I just want to kind of move on. Now, here's what I want to do. Um, I would like, since this video is really about using a confidence interval to talk about this hypothesis test, let me create a confidence interval. Now, this is a one sample T interval because I have only one sample, right? I have um, N is going to be 50 and I have um, X bar, which is 27.02 and I have the standard deviation of 4.83. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a confidence interval. Now, um, let's suppose that my alpha level here is 0.05, so a 5% alpha level. 
I'm gonna to need to know what confidence interval I want to choose based on my alpha level. And the way this works is that um, just very, very quickly, let's see if I can draw, if this shows up, hopefully this shows up here. Um, if I'm looking at the middle 95%, all right, I'm looking at this middle 95%, I have 5% left over in both of those sides. So I've got 0 0.025 here, and 0 0.025 here. Then I have to look at the type of test. Am I running a one-tailed or a two-tailed test? A one-tailed test would happen if you, one-tailed test would happen if you have a greater than or a less than in your alternative hypothesis. And a two-tailed test would be if you had a not equal to sign. So since I have a less than sign here in my null hypo, in my alternative hypothesis, I'm talking about this area here, which is a lower tail. So it's a one tail, lower tail test. This is my alpha level, all right? So that's how I can tell my alpha level of a confidence interval. Um, uh, I, I can tell my confidence level or my um, alpha level, sorry about this. Um, so this would be my alpha level that corresponds to a 95% confidence interval. Now, I, haven't, I don't know what confidence level I want in this, so I kind of have to work a little bit backwards here. So I do know that I have a five, percent alpha level so using the same idea using the same idea i have let me just draw this normal distribution in a normal or a t it's it's we're gonna have a degrees of freedom here um in this case our degrees of freedom since we're using a t test a t interval is going to be 49 but i'm i don't know what percent here that i want in my confidence interval how however i do know that this alpha level is 0 0.05 based on the fact that I have a one tail test. Well, if this is 0 0.05, then the upper tail has to also be 0 0.05. What's left over in the middle? Well, 0 0.05, 0 0.05 is 0 0.1. 0 0.1 minus, one minus 0 0.1 is, that's right, 90%. So I can get that I need to create a 90% confidence interval for this. So I can do this both ways. If I know the alpha level, I can, I can know what confidence level I'm gonna use to create. If I know the confidence interval and the confidence level, I know what alpha level that I'm gonna to need to test this on. So right now we're just going, we're gonna use a 90% confidence based on the alpha level that I have, and I'm gonna create a 90% confidence interval. So um, just reminding you what that is x bar plus or minus t star, we're using 49 degrees of freedom times s over root n. Okay, so we've got 27.02 plus or minus, and I'll get that in just a second, s which was 4.83 over the square root of 50. Okay, so we want to get um, 49 degrees of freedom. So I'm going to quickly go to my T table here. And I have 49 degrees of freedom, which is close to 50. You know, once we get over 30, the, the it's kind of hard to find that, um, that critical T value. In fact, I probably want to use a calculator uh, to do that. In fact, I will use a calculator. So give me a second, and I'm going to use a calculator. So I have my calculator here and I did an inverse T. So I did an inverse T distribution. I have 95% um, um, because I have a 5% alpha level, which subtract as one is 95. With 49 degrees of freedom is gonna give me 1.67655. All right, so I've got 1.6, 1.67. All right, and you know what, since I have the calculator here, I'm gonna just use the calculator to, to, um, to calculate this. Ah. To go and count, well, I don't know why my calculator shrinks so much. All right, so we're gonna do a one. Statistics, confidence intervals, T interval. And we're gonna use stats to do that. My X bar is 27.02. My standard deviation is 4.83. My N is 50. And we're gonna go a 90% confidence level. 
and we're going to have 25.87 and 28.17, 25.87 and 20, what was that again, 21, 28.17, okay. All right, so there's my interval. So, so check this out, check this out, guys. This is, check this out, guys. <laughs> we can't even talk today here. Uh, so check this out. What we're gonna do is we're gonna say, right, we always write this in context. We are 90% confident that the true mean, uh, what are we talking about, miles per gallon, is between the true mean miles per hour for all cars, all right, so all the company cars, is between 25.87 and 28.17 miles per gallon. And now I'm gonna, I'm just kind of doing this really, really quickly because I wanna get to the point of this video. So the point of the video were, were a couple things. The goal was, one, I did want you to see where the, where the confidence level comes from if we're looking at an alpha level and where the alpha level comes from if we're looking at a confidence level. The second thing is, how can we take our confidence interval and make an inference on the population or make a conclusion of the hypothesis that's based on our confidence interval? Let's take a look at that now. So we've got, I'm gonna shrink this down just a bit here. We've, we, were trying to, um, have a, we were trying to have a null hypothesis that the mu, the uh, mean was less than 28 miles per gallon. So what we're going to look at is we're going to look at our confidence interval. And we're going to say to ourselves, self, is the null hypothesized value within our confidence interval? The null hypothesized value is 28. Is that within my confidence interval? Yes, it is, right? It goes from 25.87 to 28.17. Yes, I know it's only 0.17, and it's like it's like more. There's more space in to, towards the 25 than it is towards the 28. But the fact that the 28 is within our interval tells us this. It tells us that hey, it is possible that 28 is our true mean. So if it's possible that 28 somewhere in there possible that it doesn't tell the confidence rule doesn't tell us like what the probability of it being 20 it just tells us that it's possible it is if it's possible that 28 is in fact the true mean then i have to fail to reject the null because look the null is that it's equal to 28 so it could be 28 in fact it could be 28.17 which in that fact that case is greater than 28 which is what we wanted our we wanted it to be all less than 28 in our in our um, alternative hypothesis. So what I would do based on this hypo this confidence interval is I would say that based on this confidence interval, I would fail to reject the null and I do not have enough evidence that the um, company has less than 28 miles per gallon in their whole fleet of cars. So here's the thing. Here's like the whole summary of, of this situation. I'm going to zoom in here to kind of summarize this, all right? So if the null hypothesis value is in the confidence interval, then you're going to fail to reject the null. which means that there's not enough evidence that the alternative is. Now, that doesn't mean that if the, if the null hypothesis value is not in the interval, do you necessarily always um, say, well, we're gonna reject the null. So here, here's the thing that's, that's tricky about it, okay? Um, if, we have, if we had a not equal to, all right? If we have a not equal to sign in our, in our alternative hypothesis, then yes, if, if the, um, if the null hypothesized value is not in the interval, then we would reject the null because it didn't matter if it's greater than or less than. But we really wanna be cognizant of which way the inner inequality is going in the alternative hypothesis. In this particular case, the inequality is less than. 
So we would have wanted to see is in our confidence interval, both values, the lower end and the higher end, both less than 28. If they had been both higher than 28, then eh, that doesn't really even make sense for what we're doing for our alternative hypothesis, right? Um, in fact, that's even worse uh, because it's like, they really, really failed, right? So uh, most of the time you're not gonna have that case in, in a stats class, um, but it is something to be aware of because it might happen in real life. The next thing I wanna mention is that this works for any type of hypothesis test. I used a one sample T interval here, but this would work for a two sample T test. But with a two sample T test, you're looking to see if zero is in the interval. So if your interval um, changes from negative to positive or positive to negative, then you know you're either failed to reject, uh, I'm sorry, you're, you're um, rejecting the null because you're really looking for zero. Did I say rejecting the null? If it goes from negative to positive, then you're going to fail to reject the null because zero is within that. And that's for a two sample t-test. For proportions, for inference of proportions, you're doing the same thing for a one, um, one prop Z test, you're looking to see if the proportion is within your interval. Again, it's just the, it's all about whether or not the null hypothesized value is in your interval. If it is in your interval, you're going to fail to reject the null. And I, I think I have somewhere here, uh, somewhere here, I, I think I did another, um, I think I have this written down as well. Uh, here we go. Here's some examples of that written down. So this is a two sample t-test. Um, so, I mean, you can take like a little, you know, pause it and take a little snip if you want. Here's some examples of what I mean by whether you reject or fail to reject the null based on what that confidence interval looks like and what those hypotheses might be. So it's really not that difficult, guys, to figure out how to make an inference um, by using your confidence interval. Now, this is, um, this is particularly important for my students. So for my students, if you... Uh, if you do the hypothesis test and you do an entire hypothesis test and I ask you specifically, use your confidence interval to answer the question, then you're not going to get any credit because I didn't ask you to do a hypothesis test. I asked you to use the interval. Okay. And that the AP, if you're an AP student watching this, the AP statistics exam does that often too. Um, where they ask you about the interval and some people write an entire hypothesis test and you don't get anything because they're not asking you about a hypothesis test. They're asking you about a confidence interval. So do the confidence interval. All right. Okay. So that's all I got for you from the rebel base. All right. And uh, we will hear from you or see you or zoom or whatever else uh, this world has for us. I'll catch you next time. Don't forget to subscribe guys. See you later. Bye. I'm